Good morning to everybody, and uh, thank you for uh, coming to this uh, Preforma conference. I'm very proud to open this event. It is uh, the last uh, uh, event of the Preforma project organized in uh, the frame of the EU-funded project. I would first of all express uh, our thankfulness to the Ministry of Culture uh, that is uh, the Estonian partner in Preforma and to the National Library of Estonia that kindly hosts this event. Here we proudly aim to present the results of four years of hard work. However, this work is not finished. There is still a lot to be done, a lot more to do, and we need to know what is going on in terms of the status of digital preservation. For this, we thank our international speakers, the panelists, and all the colleagues who contributed to the success of the project and to this final event. Eventually, I thank all of you for participating in this conference. And now I'm honored to give the floor to Christel Weyman, of Director of the Library Services at the National Library of Estonia. She coordinates and supervises the services and service providing processes in the library, as well as collection development and long-term preservation of the library collections. Christel is also responsible for the development of the related policies and strategies in the National Library. She is a member of the Standing Committee of IFLA, National Library Section, and the head of the Innovation Working Group at the Estonian Library Association. Thank you, Christelle. Dear colleagues, guests, and cooperation partners, I'm very glad to welcome you on behalf of the National Library of Estonia. Culture in its different forms shapes and unites people and communities, and the preservation of cultural heritage today helps to build the communities of the future. Printed publications, documents, and the increasingly digital uh, cultural heritage in its different formats are among the basic and most important sources which reflect the character of the society. Memory institutions have a major role in preserving these sources. The preservation and protection of printed and digital material belongs to the basic tasks of libraries, museums and archives whose ultimate aim is to enable access and the use for the future generations. And the preservation of different heritage formats requires knowledge and skills, because a rapidly developing digital world is in constant change. And the more changes we are facing, the bigger importance we attach to agreements, shared standards, and discussions in order to unify development activities. And the Legal Deposit Act that entered into force in Estonia in 2017 obligates the National Library of, uh, to collect the output of the files of all printed publications issued in Estonia and to ensure their publications and uh, developing new services based on this important data collection. For this reason, I am truly glad that the next important milestone in the long-term preservation of digital heritage will receive its final seal here in National Library of Estonia. For researchers, the key issue today and tomorrow is to have access to primary sources. A seemingly trivial fact or discovery may cause to open new research topics and may result in revolutionary changes in the recent knowledge. 
I would like uh, to end with uh, an exciting finding in the National Library's Digital Archive, Tigar. It is always interesting uh, to look back and learn what happened 100 years ago. So let uh, us have a glance into history. The world was at war. Estonia was not yet uh, an independent state, but from the spring of 1917, our country had a national autonomy. And the revolutionary events in the world filled all local newspapers. But no matter how anxious the times, people cherished culture. A leading Estonian daily newspaper published on its front page a long review of sonnets by the famous Estonian poetess Maria Unter. Today, and the sculpture of this poetess stands in front of the National Library of Estonia. And this archive finding was unexpected and brought me to think of the importance of art, literature and culture again. And preserving such exciting findings is our common goal. I would like to wish you an inspiring and successful conference. Thank you very much, Christel. I think that the role of national libraries is becoming more and more important in this information society as we started talking our life, because information should be guaranteed, should be preserved in equality and in a content, the quality of the content also beyond the formats. But coming back to the formats, I would like now to give the floor to Tarvi Sitz, uh, representing the Ministry of Culture of Estonia, Under Secretary at the Ministry of Culture. Tarvi Sitz organizes the work of the development of cultural objects and through the Director General organizes the work of the National Heritage Board. He coordinates the directions of development in the area of museums, libraries, and heritage protection, contributing to create the conditions for the growth of national culture and the preservation of the intellectual cultural heritage of Estonia. Tarvi sits in the chair of the Digital Heritage Council, too. Thank you, Tarvi. Dear guests and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to welcome you here in Tallinn. Your timing is excellent. Some weeks ago, all of European leaders met in Tallinn for the digital summit. We hope that one result was that many European Union leaders know now more about digital issues and opportunities. And that is a good result and basis to do more cooperation of the digital fields in Europe in the future. The Estonian presidency of the Council of the European Union highlights the digital aspects of life. Discussing about uh, digital society, it isn't really anything extraordinary or new. It has become part of daily life. Every day, more and more digital resources are created and published. Digital society expects everything to be accessible and present on the web. And that applies to memory institutions as well. The data film is ever increasing memory institutions are digitizing their collections. And our data production rates are growing at an alarming rate. However, we are still not capable of preserving the data. The real question here is, how do you guarantee data integrity, integrity and avail availability? Today, we are giving little no avail attention to data preservation. So far, we have focused on physical artifacts, requirements of preservation of su such artifacts. As physical objects degrade, so does data. The likelihood of data getting lost increases along with the, the amount of data in question. 
Hence, it, it is important to have tools to check that files and their contents are intact according to certain standards, with a greater goal of making the data available even after decades to be used as basis for research and case studies. Reforma project is a good example how memory institutions and universities cooperate outside their usual business by creating open source software to facilitate efficient collaboration and to consolidate resources. It is preferred to reuse ex existing open source components and technologies so that offers, so that others can also benefit from the experience and also the software. I most formally welcome you here, and I am sure you will have an inspirational conference with many bright and innovative ideas to bring home to or even to further develop internationally. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Atarvi, and thank you again for your participation in the project. Uh, before uh, entering uh, into the content, uh, the actual uh, delivery of uh, the project, uh, I would leave the floor to Mariu, who will uh, give us uh, some uh, instructions about the logistics uh, and uh, organizational aspects of the conference. Hi, welcome for, uh, also from my side. I'm very happy that you are here and so many people of, of, of you. But uh, as you have noticed, we are, uh, we are recording this event. So if you have any issues with it or problems, just let us know. Uh, if you sit in the really, really back of the hall, you won't be uh, on the picture, but please don't go, all of, all of you don't go there, otherwise we'll have a recording of the empty hall. So, uh, otherwise uh, the toilets are if you go outside on your uh, right hand, and then we will have lunch at the really, really uh, back of the hall. It's, um, it will be, really end, you will see it. There all also will be posters, and also the suppliers and the live demos will be hosted there. So if you have questions, something like that, then you can take a look at them there. Uh, and after, we will have lunch at one o'clock, and it will end at two. And if you come back here, please come back inside the hall, uh, or be at, uh, uh, area where our lunch is because uh, this is um, a special year for us uh, because the Estonian presidency of the um, European Council and they are having uh, their seminar or conference also here today with us and they also end their uh, lunch uh, during uh, the same time at uh, two, uh, two o'clock so and they will gather outside of uh, our hall so just please come inside and don't, don't get uh, mixed uh, up because it's a um, conference uh, from the Minister of Finance. So I think this, this one is better. Uh, other important thing, the Wi-Fi is free of charge and you have to uh, log in. Uh, you have to agree with all this fine print there. Uh, unfortunately, the button, uh, the orange one, is uh, in Estonian, so just agree or don't agree if you don't want. Uh, so, and also uh, to make some, um, to make it memorable or to show others what we are doing here, you can use the hashtag, hashtag performa. So please use it. But otherwise, I hope you will enjoy this uh, conference and I'm really happy that you are here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario. Um, I, I am proud now to invite to talk to us and to uh, tell us about the Performa project, Borie Giustrel. Borie is the project coordinator of Performa. He former director at the National Archives of Sweden. He has been teaching archival science at the University of Stockholm for many years. 
He has been a member of the International Committee, uh, Committees at the ICA and represented the Sweden in the expert groups on digitization and digital preservation established by the European Commission. Borje worked in a number of EU projects, including Minerva, Minerva Plus, Linked Heritage, DCNet, and DCHRP. And uh, I would just say that we worked together, so it is a long-lasting friendship. He was uh, the coordinator of Protage, very uh, milestone in the digital preservation initiatives of the European Commission. And uh, he is now talking to us about uh, the, pro the project, how it developed, and what we aimed to deliver. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words, uh, Antonella. Yes, uh, uh, I really got uh, red eyes on red uh, when I hear all the uh, things. But today we are focusing on uh, Performa. And uh, Performa, uh, as you can see here, is something that we call preservation formats for cultural information and also e-archives. It's uh, a little bit of an extension from not just archiving the old material, but also look into the future. It's much about the future that we will talk. And I will present for you what is Performa, what we have done a little bit, and also what you uh, can see then we, when it comes to... Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, the Performa itself uh, is a, what we call a pre-commercial procurement project, and is co-funded by the European Commission on the FP7 program. And in fact, I think it's the first uh, pre-commercial procurement project that they have had at the Commission uh, for uh, this sector, the cultural heritage sector. So we have been some sort of a pilot project, or in many cases, actually. We started on the 1st of January 2014, and uh, we will end now in uh, end of December this year. We have a total uh, budget for procurement of 2.8 million euro, so it's well rather big actually, if you look upon what the cultural heritage institutions normally are dealing with. We have a website, and this website is something that you can look at if you haven't done that, but, and it will also be a website there which you can look at when the project is over. We have some contacts, me of course, the project coordinator, but also Antonella Fresa, who is the technical coordinator. And we also have what we call innovation manager, Claudio Prandone, the guy here who helped with the microphone and things like that. And uh, he is especially working with, with the future and sustainability issues with, uh, with, uh, uh, from this project. The project itself has a number of partners, 15 partners actually. And uh, one of the important things here is that we can see that besides uh, the National Archives promoter and ADECA who are administrating, leading, managing the project more or less, we have technical partners and memory institutions. And the memory institutions are the procurers in, in this uh, project, actually. And uh, having a project uh, uh, with both technical partners and memory institutions means that you have experts in different areas. We have PACT, which is an expert uh, center in Belgium. We have Fraunhofer. We have Schrevde. We have University of Padua. And they are experts in different fields, testing, uh, open source, etc., etc. how to run uh, projects, which we from the cultural heritage side are not that good at um, when it comes to projects sometimes. Uh, the memory institutions are a number of them from Netherlands, Sound and Vision. We have also uh, 
Kikipa from Belgium, from uh, Film Center from Greece, uh, local government from Ireland, um, Stifton, Preussische Kulturbesitz from Germany, etc. Uh, from Spain, also Girona, uh, and also the Culture Ministry of Estonia and the National Library of Sweden. So it's, it's a mix, actually, really a mix. And I think this is uh, showing quite well that uh, the challenge that we have in digital preservation and the challenge that we are working with in Performa is something that every cultural institution have, but also when it comes to e-archiving in the future. And um, what is we dealing with? Well, it's quite simple actually, uh, because uh, we know as a member institution that we are facing uh, increasing transfer of electronic documents and also other media content for long-term preservation. We, we, we know that, we have seen that. And normally uh, the data are stored in specific file formats. It could be for documents, for images, for sound, and for video, etc. And these files are usually produced by software from different vendors. But um, even, and that's the challenge, even if the transferred files are in what we can call standardized uh, formats, the correct implementation of standards cannot be guaranteed. And um, because this, the software used for the production of the electronic files is not in the control, neither by the institutions, the memory institutions, that uh, the institutions that produce them, and by the memory institutions. No one have in the control, actually. And uh, conformance tests uh, of transfers are done, of course, by memory institutions, but they are not totally reliable. And normally, you have to use one or two or three tools to be sure that you, this is something that is a standard, actually. Uh, and because different software for testing could end up in different results. And of course, this will pose uh, problems in long-term preservation. It can jeopardize the whole preservation exercise uh, if you look upon it in a longer perspective. And uh, if you see this curve, you can see that and this is from the IDC's Digital University study from 2012. But, and, well, maybe the curve is not that uh, look exactly the same, but it shows actually that, that the growth will, is very high, actually. And um, when we started Performa in 2014, we, we showed a little bit that we have problems here, and you can feel it in the National Archives, where I'm from, but also in other institutions. We actually sent around a, a mail to a number of institutions in Europe and said, how is it about this? Is this a problem for you? And the mail box the day after was full with responses saying, yes, 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 we have problems here, we have huge problems here, we will have problems here. And today we are higher up on the curve, so we can see that the problems are, are um, more uh, visual for people now. And um, we can also see that the interest for Perform as a project have, have increased quite a lot uh, during the project time, actually. And if you look upon uh, the context also, you can say that uh, when we talk about preservation, you can, you can say that it means that we both have to take care of the bit preservation. And this is something that we have done for decades now. It's not a real problem. That's a technical part that we more or less have solved. We also have looked into the semantic preservation. We know a little bit what, how to understand the files. Uh, we have what we call documentation or metadata, sometimes we call it. So we know that quite well. But how is it with the logical preservation? How is it with the, the formats? Do we know how to open and render files in the future if we have not fully control of the standards? That's the problem, and that is actually what we are facing at and that is actually what we try to solve in the performa. That is, that, that is actually the goal for us. So uh, the aim then with the project has been to implement good quality files in various standard formats for preserving content long term. And the main objective then to give the memory institutions in the first place could also be others who is dealing with the files and preservation, full control of the process of conformity tests of files to be ingested into archives you know, of different kinds. Uh, and the main objective for the PCP that we launched uh, earlier was to develop an open source uh, software for the management of the whole conformance test process, supporting a range of standards, addressing the needs for any memory institutions or other organization that has uh, some sort of preservation task. That was the start of the project. 
Uh, as I said, we have an open source pr uh, approach, and um, the aim is to establish a sustainable research and development community in the future, and it should uh, be in that community a range of contributors and users from different stakeholder groups. And uh, that will ensure uh, the long-term availability of the software beyond uh, the project and the, and the memory institution supplies who have been involved in the Performa project. Uh, the license is all the software developed by Performa uh, is provided under two specific open licenses and, uh, and um, all digital assets developed during the Performa will be provided on Creative Commons CC uh, by uh, and, uh, open, and in open for file formats. So it's free to use the results of the project. Uh, the target users then, we have the memory institutions, uh, um, of course, that are in, uh, involved in um, or planning for digital culture initiatives. We have the developers who are contributing code for the open source tools that we have uh, developed in Performa. We have research organizations provide the technical devices to culture stakeholders, standardization bodies, of course, funding agencies, Ministry of Cultures, and or the national and regional administrations that, that own and manage digitization programs. We have other projects in the digital culture heritage domains. Quite a lot of stakeholders. It's very broad in this sense. And um, we can uh, say that we are now, as I said earlier, entering the last phase. Normally, in this kind of, of projects, PCP projects, we have a number of phases. We have a design phase, you have a prototyping phase, and a testing phase. That is what is normal. And we are, have now entered, entered the testing phase and are now more or less closing the testing of the, of the pro products. And everything will be, be over then in the um, uh, the end of this year, actually, when we close the project. Uh, the suppliers, of course, we talked about PCP and, and, and we also have suppliers. Uh, when we started in the design phase, we, we started with six uh, suppliers. And uh, uh, in red, you can see those who were selected for the prototyping phase and the testing phase. We have Vira PDF Consortium, we have uh, EC Nova, and we have Media Area. And they were all working, uh, working with different formats, PDF, TIFF, on uh, video and sound formats. And uh, you will have a chance to actually meet them outside here uh, from 2 o'clock. They, they will give you a live demonstration, so you will have a chance also to, by yourself, see what, is, uh, what the results are, actually. Uh, the challenge uh, that I talked about, uh, uh, the research challenge then was, as I said, to empower memory institutions to gain full control of the technical properties of digital content intended for long-term preservation. And the question was from the beginning, how shall we manage to do that? Well, uh, the strategy has been to develop an open source uh, conformance checker that, first of all, checks if, if a file complies with standard specifications, checks if a file complies with the acceptance criteria of the memory institutions, policy checking, and that is quite a new element here because even if you have standards, standards can sometimes be very, very blurry and not completely in line what you would like to have. Sometimes uh, a part of the standards uh, may be impossible for US and memory institutions to implement, actually. Uh, there are parts of, of standards sometimes that can be illegal, more or less. For example, you should have, uh, for TIFF standards, you need to, to, there are tags that shows that uh, this is the, the guy who actually um, created this, et cetera, et cetera, names and so, which are not in, in line with, with the national legislation sometimes. Um, so you need also to have policy checking in the sense that the in-memory institutions itself can set up policies which need to be checked. Uh, what also should be developed is to also to report back to human and software agents and so perform uh, simple fixes. And this is something that you can see then when, when we have this um, in, in the afternoon, uh, also um, a possibility from two o'clock to, to see this. I, I don't know exactly where, but it could be in, this, in the neighborhood here. 
Uh, the other strategy, part of the strategy, was to establish an ecosystem around an open source imp reference implementation that could generate uh, useful feedback for those who control software, could advance this improvement of the standard specification, and also advance this development of the new business cases for managing preservation files. So this was actually the strategy, and this is actually what we have managed to, to do now, or um, the suppliers have managed to do, actually. Uh, one question we always get, uh, have you managed to handle all formats? I mean, you must have made some sort of, of, of um, uh, cho choice here. And um, we choose some formats for text. We choose this PDF, different versions of PDF, different standards. And that was uh, uh, to strengthen the consensus of, uh, when it comes to text. When it comes to images, we, we, we took TIFF to improve the consensus. There's a lot of TIFF files out there, uh, millions of TIFF files. Uh, this is uh, something that um, uh, a number of institutions have struggled with today, how to handle all these TIFF files. And we have moving images, which is what we could see as a, some sort of virgin path here. And we can see that, that uh, the, the choice we have made here have managed to be something uh, important in that market too. So this is what we, what we took in the first part uh, in the project. But there are, of course, a number of other file formats that need to be handled when the project is over. Um, if you look upon um, the, these open source conformance checkers that are in place now uh, under deployment, they are all available both for local use and for, uh, as a web-based application. And they allow for employment in different infrastructures and environment. You have it as a uh, standalone. You have it as a client server. And you has it, have it as a plugin also to be integrated in, in your own uh, legacy systems or backbone system or what you call it. So it's a number of, of, of opportunities here. And as I said, you have a chance to look upon them and uh, see you for yourself here in this afternoon. So, uh, well. Uh, if you would like to follow us, you can follow us on the website, of course, and on the blog. Uh, and um, I hope you will do that. And uh, uh, the website will be up uh, even if the, system, uh, the project is over. So you have a chance to see what will happen there. And we, I suppose we have a chance to talk a little bit about what will happen in the future here during the conference. So in the end, I hope you will be full of information on the Performa project and what the Performa project have managed to, to, to produce and also what will happen in the future. So I hope we will have a good conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aborie. Um, for those who are interested in the demos, remember that the demo stations are at the end of the corridor. So you turn right and you go and you find the demo stations. Um, I am proud now to invite Julia Kim. Julia is the digital assets specialist at the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress. She works on creating born digital and digitized workflows on major collections such as Story Corps, the Alan Lomax Archive, and Indigenous American Cylinder Recordings. She holds a master degree from the New York University Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program, is an alumna of the New York National Digital Stewardship Residency Program and a member of XFR Collective, an audiovisual nonprofit. I have looked at the internet, it is really an interesting initiative. I invite you all to look at it. She has a background in time-based media, digital forensics, and the complex media. Julia is going to talk to us why can they files, formats, software, users, standards, all just get along. Thank you, Julia.
first off, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm really looking forward to the next several days of talks and workshops. I'm really excited to be here for the, this culmination of four years of work distributed across institutions and nations. Uh, Performa is really valuable not only for the tools and papers it's disseminating, but for the people it's bringing together. So I'm really looking forward to meeting you all and spending some time over the next several days. The title of my talk is, Why Can't They All Just Get Along? Um, from many perspectives, interoperability is understood as primarily a technical hurdle. While there are no shortage of technical hurdles, I don't think that maybe we should always be focusing on that. Um, in preparing for Performa, as a first-time conference participant, I scoured the web for documentations. While I primarily know about it through my own increasing reliance on the uh, tools that have come out of it at my work at the Library of Congress, I was struck by the language about the project on the website. The main objective of the project is to give memory institutions full control of the process of the conformity tests of files to be created, migrated, and ingested into archives through the development of a set of tools which enables this process to happen within an iteration that is under full control of institutions. For the first part of my talk, I'd like to explore how revolutionary that phrase is, taking full control, within the context of common technical impediments, before I talk a little bit about the work I'm involved with, and then look towards the future of Performa, some more open-ended speculation. So why can't we all get along? So I'll talk a little bit about some incompatibilities, but in general, the world is just full of opacity, incompatibility, and difficulty. Uh, here's a recent example uh, in terms of the standards themselves being incorrect. Our whole map or guideline is flawed. How can we aim for that if that's the case? Um, or the standards may not be widely followed, for example, with CDDA and Redbook, so they're not even adopted. Uh, validation tools themselves may need to go through rounds and rounds of bugs and versioning, or may not be always clear or explicit about how they get their outputs. Uh, this is in a recent issue on the Jovlo serve, with the odd byte truncation uh, with TIFF EXIF tags that created Jove invalidation. So there's the issues of various intervening software and hardware necessary in processing workflows, uh, and the lack of clarity about what's happening until maybe at the end uh, when things are stripped and become non-compliant with checkers. Uh, I feel like this odd byte issue is like time repeating itself per perhaps. Uh, this truncation is not really maybe that much of a technical difficulty. Uh, so it can sort of feel like time repeating itself. Um, and then when you get to round tripping files for access, this is from a Dave Rice paper through Tate. Um, but the players may have incompatibility. So this is a bright sign player incompatibility with uh, metadata truncation. And then um, that's at the very end. So only at the very end do you realize it, it can't actually play in the hardware that it's intended for. Um, so there are a lot of problems actually. Uh, and there's that sense of circularity with the above issues of the whole archival endeavor sort of being like a dog chasing its tail, sort of going back and forth from the beginning to the end of navigating both file creation and migrations and playback, and then the whole ecosystem, as referenced earlier. Uh, this is an example of how I actually came out to perform us. So it's an example of a beautiful failure from the Civil Rights History Project. Uh, congressionally mandated collection co-owned by the Library of Congress and the newest Smithsonian Museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Only later, through the diligence of colleagues, many, many years, almost a decade after ingest, did we realize that there were both total, total failures and not opening and playable failures detected through a large subset of our born digital collection um, of QuickTime ProRes 422 files. While we were ultimately able to recover, or I wouldn't be discussing this, uh, only maybe a handful of so of the files were actually damaged so much that um, they were unplayable. Uh, and th the other issues would have only been noted because of missing audio streams. So 
po possibly a variety of different issues uh, in the processing and ingest stream. Or in this example, from the processing of the Jeremy Blake collection, which included, among other things, approximately 400 optical disks, which through round tripping the ISO disk images created into emulated Mac environments resulted in various garbled PSD images. So the baseline images themselves, among other things, were flawed. Uh, so there are countless examples of an interoperable problems, some of which don't even come to the fore until you do the whole round tripping and actually have to think about access or playback. Why are, do we have all these problems? Well, I think that some of this is, this is where I get into more speculation, uh, to that larger ecosystem of factors. So they might not be anyone's clear responsibility, but may be at the edge of our core responsibilities. Speaking for myself as a digital archivist, there may be a sense of whose job is this really? Uh, while it is our job as archivists to ensure the long-term preservation of files, it may not be as emphasized. This slide actually tangentially highlights that perspective. It's a graph that came out of the Digital Stewardship Competency Profiles published at IPRES 2015 in Switzerland, in which the important thing to note is that the standards and best practices rank very last among all the different competency areas. Um, so while there are limitations to this study, I would say that this sort of mirrors my own experience, anecdotally. More speculation. Many archivists and institutions have public neutrality statements of some sort, whether blanket neutrality, or more specifically neutrality as to vendors, solutions, and then even formats, perhaps. This neutrality can be interpreted in some ways as passivity. I'm generalizing, but these attempts at neutrality sometimes are emphasizing the necessarily conservative aspects of our profession in terms of that long-term process of preservation, which may be at odds with that initial statement of, that I thought was revolutionary in a sense of taking full control, which does mean influencing and taking a stance on vendors, commercial entities, standards organizations out there, and communicating and influencing commercial, nonprofit, and for-profit sectors internationally. Um, I think we can and should go about trying to influence the cultural field as to what's being used, what do we adopt, and expand our roles. Um, and part of this detriment, I think, is partly because archivists are usually placed at the very tail end of the life cycle, well after files are created, well after this whole ecosystem has been in play. Uh, those two images are just some of the collections that I work with, just because I wanted to highlight them. One's from our uh, web folklore's uh, Who's the Man Dog uh, web capture, and the other is a Native American cylinder. But for my contacts working with et ethnographers and folklorists, it's very difficult to determine and enforce submission guidelines well after everything has already been created. The complexity, of course, is not itself bad. In fact, there are many affordances in areas like audiovisual because of the lack of consolidation of clear de facto standards and formats. This, I believe, presents us with a very unique opportunity. We can actually determine the rules of the game still. We can actually really influence things from the get-go. Um, but I believe, again, many archivists want to stabilize targets and answer simple yes or no questions rather than necessarily get involved in actually determining these issues for themselves or question whether or not we should rethink larger ecosystem factors. Speculation. So TIFF has been around for over three decades. PDFs are just very difficult because of their nature as um, container formats and audio flack or wave is stabilized to such a degree that I think the industries are ready perhaps to check them off as semi-permanently done. I don't really have any clear coherent thoughts on these, but I think it's worth discussion. While I'm a newcomer to Performa, I think there are a lot of direct parallels to work in the U.S. Um, in the context of FAGI, the Federal Agency's Dig Digital Guidelines Initiative, which was started in 2007 and has over 20 participating agencies that can, can be, that can include agencies as diverse as NASA, um, the National Space Aeronautics Organization, and um, NIST, um, National Institute for Technical Standards, I believe, um, and of course the Library of Congress, where I am. Uh, it's roughly divided into two groups, still image and moving image. Um, I actually work in the moving image group along with uh, 
some of my colleagues. Um, Fagi has many impacts and benefits to the community. Again, I think that mirrors some of the outputs of Performa and what Performa is doing. I mostly know about Fagi through work through BWF Metadata. BWF MetaEdit is a software that is in widespread use, uh, has been widely adopted. Um, shout out to Jerome, actually, and, uh, for the latest release that is now available. Um, but part of it initially came about, while there's this tool that was output, was initial round table discussions on how to map a wave file metadata, what fields did we want to use, what are the minimal practices, what are best practices. So determining those and creating guidelines and then eventually putting out money on the table to have third parties, various third parties, as you can see from the logos, make a tool um, that through sponsorship, sponsorship of something like FAGI with over 20 institutions has become a pretty, pretty widespread, widely adopted for uh, embedding metadata and WAV files. The trajectory of BWF is actually something we're now doing with DPX files. Um, and this is where my involvement with FAGI started several years ago. Uh, we recently released a guideline for embedding da uh, metadata and scanned motion picture images. Um, so again, this trajectory is following BW BWF, where we initially sit down look at uh, some of the commercial tools that were out there and how they were mapping um, different parts to embed metadata and what was the availability um, and then coming up with a standard. And then at this point, we will soon put out an RFP or put out money for a third party contractor to again create a tool which will be in widespread use within federal agencies and will influence, can only influence widespread adoption and use I believe, in our fields, in the archival fields. So, sorry. Um, so while there are many parallels to work in the US federal institutions, I think I can only talk about how um, some of these are mir mirrored by Performa, but then there are other things in terms of bringing people together and creating these long-lasting relationships for creating tools, but also creating um, new widespread adoption through the fact of bringing together many, many institutions across nations, across industries together. Um, unlike FAGI, Performa is a unique collaboration in incorporating uh, for profits and across nations from the get-go. And there's more of a sustained interaction between these maybe more silo professions. Um, so to end, I must naturally ask, what is life after Performa? Is this it? Are there other models out there? Uh, consortiums that might work? Will tools be sustained primarily by developers working on borrowed time? Or uh, also will the Will there be expansion of other uh, formats or mediums, uh, for example, 3D? I say this because Performa is so obviously important and valuable a contributor to the field. And I don't want my first time here to be the last time we all get together to discuss these things. Um, so I, to conclude, I invite speculation on how we can all get together files, formats, standards, and people, and work together on these issues. Thank you.